Back when I first started making records, and I mean way back when I was made my first one at the age of 16, uh, I ended up having to be part of the band on the album uh, because I only had two guys with me, Ray Legier on mandolin and fiddle and Frank Duty on banjo. So that left a gaping hole in the unit. There's no rhythm player and no bass player. So I stepped up to the plate and overdubbed those parts and became the bed of the recordings. So it was, I was playing lead guitar and singing, and these two guys were playing their arses off with me. But I was also the core of the band, bass and rhythm guitar. So I learned early on that... Uh, it was the easiest way to achieve something in the studio was to do it yourself. And as I progressed through my career and was able to have finances to hire people to play with me, um, even that at a certain point didn't appeal to me because sometimes I had better ideas than the guys that were playing with me. And of course, you can't just stop a session and go, hey, buddy, play this, because the guy is a genius. And, uh, you know, and you don't want to, you know, you don't want to insult him. So a lot of times records were made, I made records with guys playing with me, and I thought, man, I would have done that little thing differently, or I would have done... So it, so it, it sort of became the only way that I could get all my ideas out and feel like I had you know, purged myself of all these ideas and got them out in the world was to make records by myself. And now, mind you, <laughs> that isn't always a good idea. Sometimes you get stuck in your own loop and whatnot when, you're, when it's just you alone in the studio creating everything. But in those days, it was... Uh, it wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't a, you know, a well-known fact that anybody did that at all, that there was artists, like famous artists, who, who were the only ones on their records, people like Prince and, and the Police and Sting. Sting overdubbed all the vocals, all the, some of the guitar parts. Like, there was, a, there was a lot of people doing it, and nobody actually realized it because they just weren't aware of the technical ability of a recording studio and how powerful overdubbing really was. And I remember having a conversation with Lightfoot one time, and he was a big, big fan of one of my uh, instrumental albums called Times Eight. It's a mandolin record. And of course, he was also a huge fan of the tribute album I made for him. And this is a man who had known me for 20 years and had heard all of my albums um, and so he started to talk about some of these records uh, that he loved of mine. And he said, he said, he said, I hope we get together soon because uh, I'd like to see you live again. And he said, and I'd like to see your, I'd really like to meet your band. You have a tremendous band on these albums. These, I'd like to meet these guys. <laughs> and I said, I said, what album are you talking about? He said, well, the, the band you got on the Long River, the, you know, the tribute album I made to him, he says, the band that's on that album is just incredible. And I said, Gordy, um, and I felt kind of bad, say that, because I, it was such a mistake on his part, but how would he know, right? Um, I said, I said, well, I, 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 I'm sorry, but there's nobody on that record but me. I'm playing all the parts all of the instruments, singing all the vocals. I was alone when I made that record. And he went, you're kidding me. I said, no. I said, that album and Times 8 and some of the other ones he really liked, I said, those are, I'm all alone. I'm just sitting in my studio overdubbing the whole record. And he said, my God, man. He said, I, I had no idea. I said, well, yeah. And then he said, he said, that's your biggest problem. I said, what do you mean? 
He said, no one knows that. He said, if I didn't notice it, because, I mean, obviously, this guy is a master recording artist, right? He said, if I could, if he says, if I didn't catch that, your ordinary audience member will never know it. They just, unless, because if they don't read the liner notes, they might even think that you're not even mentioning the people in the band. He said, he said, that's, he says, it's amazing. He said, I, I'm, he says, I can't believe that that's, you're alone. And he said, more people should know that. And, uh, I was, <laughs> I was like, well, you know, whatever, but, uh, you know, at least, you know, when I made a record, I, <laughs> I didn't have to worry about firing anybody. Well, I almost fired myself a couple times. <laughs> When Andre started with us, um, I was just coming off uh, a couple of uh, instrumental albums. One of them is one of them I just mentioned. Uh, after Now That the Work Is Done came out, which of course, now i got to mention that as well. That, that album was produced up in Dave Gunning's first uh, recording studio, which was upstairs in a little house in Pictotown. And I had uh, Dave Burton on drums and Jamie Gaddy on bass. And we were the core band. And that album was as well produced as anything I ever did by myself. Because, the, you know, Dave and Jamie are just genius, genius players, both of them. And they were into the idea of me being the entire rest of the band, like they, they got it, right? Like they knew I was hearing, even though at the, while we were playing, we're just hearing my rhythm guitar, drums and bass. And some of it was just me and the drums as a bed. We, they understood I could hear an entire band in my head. And so it was really easy to work with those two guys. They, they got it, right? Um, so I was coming off of that record, which in my, at the time I thought was the, was the pinnacle of my production skills. And it was a big album. It was an, it was overproduced, I think in a lot of ways, but I just loved it. It had, it was just one of those records that I made over the years that I thought, man, I'll never get tired of hearing this album. And I haven't, I still listen to this record all, you know, once in a while, once a year, I'll listen to it. Whereas, you know, an album like Another Morning, I, I shied away from because, as I've said earlier in this series, it, it, it wasn't what was in my head. And it bothers me that that never came out. But that's what I'm getting to in this episode. So I came off of that record. And then I met this guy in Boston one night at my uncle's house, Uncle Joe. I was down there playing some fiddle tunes, visiting with him me and Hilda, and we were having a big jam in Joe's basement, and I met this guy named Terry Egan. Uh, so Terry Egan, how do I even describe this man? Well, Terry Egan was, is, and was at the time, and still is, one of the most astoundingly generous thoughtful human beings that I've ever encountered in my entire life. They're like the man is a living saint. There's, there's no other way to describe him. 
And I started to find out about his story. And what his story was, was incredibly unique. He had a wife that he loved more than anything. And he had kids. And he, she became ill with cancer. And ended up in palliative care at the end. And her one, her dying wish was to just go outside one last time, to be wheeled outside so she could see the sky and the trees and, and smell the air. And, and she didn't get to do that. And he made a promise to her that he was going to do something about this. So he, after she passed on, he started a campaign called the the Patio Project, the Healing Gardens, he called it. And what he did was he started to raise money through music to build these beautiful gardens attached to cancer hospitals where where terminal patients and 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 just patients patients in in treatment could be could be wheeled outside in these gardens and the man is a saint he, he and he's continued to do this he's built gardens at m many different hospitals in both countries the united states and canada and he has a major love of music and so i became involved with this guy and he he was like okay i said well let me make we'll make a record and you can sell it and keep the proceeds and I'll sell it and whatever. And so we started putting plans together to make albums. And I had, I needed new steer, I needed new uh, recording equipment. And so Terry Egan said to me, you know, if you, well, if you're going to, if you're going to start building records for me, I'm going to help you make the studio. And he just gave me the money to buy the equipment. And so I did. I bought a Pro Tools rig. It's how I got my first studio. Terry Egan paid for my equipment. And uh, I started to work on records right away, and I made the the Mandel album. Times Eight came out; it was a great success. He still sells it today. It's on the Patio Records label, and I and then I did a a, a rather a famous album that sort of was not printed very much or often as I would have liked, but it's still for sale through Terry, and I don't have any copies of it. But it was an album called velvet arm golden hand and it was a duet it was a duet record between me and my uncle joe who was one of the world's greatest cape breton fiddlers and joe was was quite aged at the time 73 years old but he played brilliantly and that album i'm very proud of and my association with terry is uh and i haven't talked to terry for a while but i'm sure i'll hear from him he, he, he calls me every few years to, to get me to go do one of his his major concert events where he raises thousands and thousands of dollars for these to build these new gardens on these hospitals and i've never said no and i've usually you know not wanted to take and he pays us to go do it it's just like the man is golden there's like there's only you meet people like that in your life and it's so rare, it's so rare to meet human beings that that tr truly have no dark ulterior motive, or ulterior, I should say. They, they really are exactly what they look like. And what they're doing is all above board, all above, like, just top-notch humans. And Terry Egan is one of the top-notchest guys I've ever met in my life. And uh, I've supported him for years and vice versa. And I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now without that initial investment that he made for my equipment that put me in control of my own recording career. And right to this day, now mind you, the gear is long gone and worn out. I, but I paid for the, the upgrade of my studio all these years from that one investment. I made records that that paid for my life because Terry invested in me. And uh, I, there's no way to even equate what, what I owe him, you know, spiritually, financially, uh, 
and he's, I'm not the only guy he's helped. He's helped numerous artists in their career. And, you know, it's just, it's amazing that there's still people like that around. And also amazing that I got to meet him and, and have him in my life. And so that's Terry Egan. And I, and I had to talk about Terry because obviously his involvement completely altered the path that I was on as a recording artist and as an artist. It, it freed my creative, my creativity in such a way that it just, it just opened every door immediately. I was standing there with an open door in front of me and it was like, make what you want to make. Don't let anybody else tell you nothing. Record what's in your head because you don't have to pay for it. Here it is. No studio time, no studio musicians, no schedule, no clock. And then I went and tried to pass that on to other artists as well. So when I started to produce other people, I didn't put a clock on. I just, I just, I would give a bulk, I would give a bulk rate for a recording, a bulk price and no clock, no worries. And now I charge an hourly rate in my studio. But even then my, you know, I can make a record for very little money because I work really fast. And I've just always kept that in front of my head all these years that I got helped by a guy to make great records for, you know, decades. And I should help other artists do the same thing. And I have, and I'm very proud of that. The people that I've produced have gone on to win ECMAs and Music Nova Scotia awards. And I'm, I'm really proud that I, that I was able to, to put these artists out in front of people where they belonged, where they deserve to be. Right. And there's so many of them yet that I'm, that I'm working with right now and that I, I will meet and I will say, yeah, you need to make a record. You need to get out. Let's do it. And it's just been a very, the whole process, the, the seed that Terry Egan planted is, is still continues to grow and I harvest it every single year. It, 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 the ripple effect continues to, sh to shoot out, right? It's incredible. So all that was going on and here come Andre. And the first thing I noticed about Andre Bourgeois was that the man was a brilliant musician at heart. He, and he loved some really cool music. He, him and I would, would, he wasn't the kind of guy that sort of sat idly by as you were putting musical ideas together and just sit there and would do nothing. He would hear something and go, okay, hey, l l check out this recording. And he'd f go find a record that, that that had the direction that he thought it should go in. And the man was bang on 99% of the time. And he was also a wicked singer. He had a, he could sing, he was a big Beach Boys fan. And he introduced me to some, some of the Beach Boys music that I didn't even know existed. And I, I gained this massive appreciation for Brian Wilson, uh, who, uh, you know, when I started to find out about these, I knew, I knew what everybody knows about them, but started reading some of the biographies and watching some of the movies about Wilson. And like Brian Wilson was a genius, like beyond genius. The man had so much in his head that it drove him insane. And so I, I was at a loss at that point in time to figure out what record to put out. And Andre was like, well, we do have to, let's make a record because we need a new product. I'll back up a little bit here because there's a few other things going on. Uh, he decided to put me with, I think he tried to put me with Peck Hand first, which was a, a company that I'd already worked with and had a great deal of success. But of course, I had left the company badly. And I remember I told you earlier in a series, I threatened to punch my agent in the face. And uh, I've pissed off everybody in this business at one time or another, believe me. Some of it was unnecessary, me being an asshole, and but other other 
times it was me calling people out for doing bad things and and they didn't like that and i i got a, i got a reputation pretty quickly for just being hard on just being hard to get along with and i'm not i'm not hard to get along with i just expect people to 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 conduct business with with loyalty and honor that's that's it and it's so hard to find that in this business that i've i've just i've disrespected people that are in high power positions who i witnessed being dicks and so you know most artists in the business anywhere are like well they they okay well we can't say anything to him because he holds the keys to the kingdom and i was never impressed by that so i pissed off a lot of people and uh so anyhow he there was a double whammy in that situation because now here's here's how now i don't know if this is true i actually i i suspect it's true i don't know I can't speak intelligently to all the details of this. I'll just tell you what I know myself. There was a double whammy on poor Andre with, with Pekan because uh, so Pekan was Natalie's first major agent and they made a fortune with her and made her a fortune. And when she got really big with Warner Brother uh, with Warner Brothers Records and and was having all the success, uh, a larger, much larger, more powerful agency called Feldman and Associates uh, stepped in and said, we want Natalie, and we're willing to buy her from Pacan. We'll pay you guys, you know, Natalie and Andre and that machinery, we'll buy her. We'll, we'll pay you a bonus to... to to take her from Pacan and put her with us, and these things happened all the time. This, this is this is wheeling and dealing. Well, apparently it happened. They, they just they left Pacan uh, without discussing it. Just left them and went with Feldman. Of course, Feldman did a tremendous job for her and made her a millionaire, I guess, or whatever you want, whatever she, whatever you can be as a fiddler in this world she's done well obviously um and so th- there was a there was a huge rift there and so there was a double whammy but i i think i ended up with them for a short time i can't even remember and i even ended up with feldman at one point through andre andre was trying his best to get me you know the best service he could get me and with people that he knew could get the job done. So that was that was all going, you know, however. And it it worked because we were getting good we were getting good gigs and, and getting good money. And uh but it came time to make a record and I was I was pretty prolific with my albums. I'd already made you know, I had made four albums in the US. I had made another four or five or six here and then there was some out of print stuff or stuff that had been recorded and never released. And so I had all this material. And I got it in my head to to do a best-of collection. But I didn't want to do a normal best-of collection. I didn't want to do a compilation album. So I, I said to Andre, I said, let's do, let's do a retrospective of both sides of my career, the <coughs> instrumental side and the songwriter side. And we'll do a double album release. We'll do an album of all instrumentals, which will be a true compilation. We'll take off all these records. And then we'll do a second disc, which is all singing and original songs. And we'll re-record all of them. And throw a couple of new songs in as a bonus, unreleased stuff, right? So there we went. It was like, yeah, that's a great idea. So the the project became known as Looking Back. Looking Back Volume 1, which was the instrumentals, which was actually a true compilation of all my my favorite things off my picking records. And then this juggernaut of 
re-recordings of all my most popular original songs on Looking Back Volume 2. And the reason it got made was very simple. Uh, as I said before, at that time, now I don't really think this way, but at that time I had a serious hatred on for another morning. I didn't. I just thought it could have been better, different, whatever. I don't. I don't know. I just was like, want to get my fingerprint on this goddamn album. So there was some songs from that that we did, re-recorded, whole, completely new versions, out of my head uninfluenced by a by a, a producer, right? And we took some of the best songs off of Now the Work is Done for the same reason that I felt I had overproduced Now the Work is Done. It was a brilliant record, but I I had I was like a kid in a candy store. So I had done I thought too much on that record. So I thought I'm gonna go back and redo these some of these, right? Well the album, we, Andre didn't just sit at home waiting for me to finish this thing. And he told me one night, he said, you know, I've always been in a, you know, sitting in the studio, watching one of my artists record, and I have all these brilliant ideas, and, and, I, and I've, in the past, have tried to, to, you know, say, hey, what if we did this, and... Either the artists themselves or the producer on hand just shot me out of the saddle, and I couldn't get a word in edgewise. And I and I, and I said, you know, from hanging around with you as long as I have now, and seeing the music you listen to, and the knowledge you have about it, I said, why don't you just come to the house and and we'll produce this record together? And he jumped at the opportunity. He was like man, yes, let's do it. So I can honestly say that uh, that album, producing that album with Andre, was one of the best productions that I've ever done. The album itself, as, you know, a saleable entity, didn't do well because they were re-recordings of popular songs and we didn't push it out there. I think a lot of the people that listen to my music don't even know this album exists. They think or they think it's it is just a compilation of of older recordings. They don't realize that we redid everything on this album. So the process that we went through to make this record was absolutely joyous. It was unbelievable Working with Andre in the studio was just like working with a tornado. The man, the man had brilliant ideas, and he he understood my limitations as a musician, and he pushed them. He'd be like, "Okay, that idea is great," he said, "but you could do this, do this part here," and I'd be like, "Damn, that's not going to be easy." He said, "Yeah, well, that's why you should do it." And uh, so we came up with, I think, some of the best arrangements that I've ever done. Uh, like ones that stand out to me really big on that album was the, the re-recording of Now That The Work Is Done, which was done with no instrumentation. It was me singing four vocal parts, bass, baritone, lead, and tenor, back, background, with a little bit of, tiny little bit of rhythm guitar you can barely hear, and singing the lead over this four-part, this male chorus, which was amazing. It just and, and he pushed me to do it. He's like, you can do this. You can sing those low bass notes. You can do, you can do it. Just do it. Think, you know, think Brian Wilson. Think, think bluegrass gospel quartet. Think all the stuff that you've, all the experiences that you've had as a singer, a harmony singer, do that, right? And I did, and it turned... We used to... When we first recorded that stuff, we would sit at the kitchen table and just sit there and put it in a CD player and listen to the playback on commercial CD player. And just... It would blow our minds because 
we were in un, we were in uncharted territory really we were trying to to we were trying to one up recordings that were already popular and they lived in the minds of my followers my listeners right a certain way and we were trying to alter that this is another way the song can be we were and we were trying to make it so interesting that it would be accepted by those who automatically heard it in the original version and i'm telling you it was one of the most amazing exercises i have ever participated in in my entire career and i uh i'm as proud of that album as anything i have ever put out and to this day i still listen to that record and marvel at how acoustic it is how how rich the production is without being weird and overpowering how unexpected some of the things in the album are and i'm just super super proud of that record i it, it was it just sounded sonically was so so fucking good and it was a, it's almost a sin that we utilized this massive kind of two brain production uh powerhouse to re-record old material but i'm still not sad we did it and uh that year both of the albums won an ECMA actually i think there was even i think there was three records i think we actually put out volume 1 and 2 and take five, the banjo record we made, which he was also involved in as producer. And all three of those records won an ECMA that, that, that cycle. And I remember there's a, there's actually, there might even be a picture in the credits of this show where you see my hand holding two ECMA simultaneously. I had won three. There was another picture of me holding three of them, and that was the year. So my peers and the industry really loved the records. And obviously, I mean, I, I, was, I won, I think it was Bluegrass Album of the Year, Instrumentalist of the Year, and Folk Roots of the Year, I think is what the three things I won. And uh, we were highly vindicated by this me and andre right because it was it was his first time to be allowed to use his chops with one of his artists in such a personal way like producing a record is it's highly personal and intense and can result in people really getting upset with each other and arguments and sometimes falling out all together over someone's you know i think we should do this no i think we should do that and it becomes i've seen people get into shoving matches in studios and not me i've i've, I've you might have heard that that happened but it's never happened <laughs> um so we were really really vindicated by this and um so the next thing that happened there was a there was a bunch of things happening in the background and I got to talk about another guy in my life who who altered my life and altered altered the course of my writing and things. He's a gentleman from Moncton. He's actually from Blacks Harbor originally in New Brunswick, but he lives in Moncton. He's lived in Moncton most of his life. And uh his name is Russell Soller. And uh, he has a son named Russell Soller Jr., who's also a genius, but we're not talking about him. We will later, but we're going to talk about Russell Sr. Russell Soller and his wife, Karen. Um, this man was my hero. I, I met this guy when I was, I don't know, 14 at the festivals around Nova Scotia, and he 
was a wicked banjo player. Like the, I think the best banjo player that's ever been in Canada. Uh, I know there's a lot of them around now, but at the, in those days, that man played just like J.D. Crow, just like him. The tone, the timing, and and Earl, like he, he was the consummate American banjo player, right? Which is, which is very difficult to do for Canadians to play Americana and American music without those little subtle, almost subliminal signals that they're Canadian and, and they're they're interpreting an American music. Because we do everything a little differently, and they love it down in the states, the way that we see their music and and all the, and all that the whole scene, right? But it's very difficult for a Canadian to sound like an American because we just don't have the same sensibility about music. We have a we have almost like a happier, rounder feeling to music. Everything that we do, it's more colorful and more lively somehow. I don't even know how to describe it. But when I go down to the States and play their music, they're just amazed by it. They're like, man, you play, you got a, they call it an accent. Man, that guy plays a fiddle with a Canadian accent, don't he? And that's what they say, and it's true. We have our own accent here for everything that we do. But Russell... He understood the mechanics of the banjo better than anybody I've ever known. And we, like, the man was my hero. I followed this guy around like a puppy dog every time I was near him. And him and I, over years of jamming and hanging out and drinking and laughing, and we became very close friends, like brothers, uh, like his wife, Karen, was, you know, used to say, if Russell and JP never picked up an instrument, they'd still be best friends. And it was true. We were just buddies. And Russell Soller is also one of the best songwriters I've ever met. And not many people know that because he doesn't push it, but the guy is a genius songwriter. And I mean genius. And... So he and I, for some reason, I don't know how we even got on this, but we started writing songs together. And there was a long period there of about a year. Well, it actually might have started when I asked him to transcribe Primary Color because he did, he's also a master transcriber, right? So he, he wrote the tablature book on that album and we put it out and sold it. It didn't sell well, unfortunately. I just sold the last couple copies of the first the first 700 I printed. They've lasted all this time. It's like nearly 20 years. It just didn't sell, which was unfortunate because it was a brilliant book and he did a fantastic job of of transcribing every single note I played on that album. So anyhow, all that's going on in the background, right? Me and Russell are starting to write songs and we're writing some deadly songs like The Ghosts of Canso and Eyes of the Widow and uh, there's a slew of them that we, that we started putting together. And pretty soon, you know, after all that stuff and looking back and had happened and we started... The following year, we were like, well, we better make a record. And so that's where I'm going to kind of leave this off here because that's a whole other episode. And But this material that Russell Soller and I wrote together uh, is still, in my opinion, among the best stuff I ever put out. And it, 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 it gave birth to an album and a concept. I was always a huge fan of concept albums, you know, albums that had some integrated message within the, the songs and the sequence of the songs and all these things. 
And all that writing and some of the stu- writing that I was doing on my own was about to give birth to my favorite record I ever made. Um, and Andre was right at the helm again as producer and or co-producer. I don't even know if he wanted that credit, but I always made sure he got it. And if there's anybody out there who knows Andre, Andre manages the Bear McNeils now, among other people, and has for a long time. You know, if anybody knows that man, uh, and you didn't know what kind of a genius that guy had for production and music in general, uh, take a little closer look, because the guy really has some chops, and so this story is long, so I have to spread it over several episodes, and, uh, of course, it doesn't end well, uh, but the things that occurred before the ending, by God, <laughs> there was some tremendous music made and tremendous recordings, and I, and I thought, you know, success, successful things, uh, but we're going to get into that in the next episode, but... Yeah, we're, uh, again, I love doing this. I love doing this. Uh, There's a lot of things that come into my mind in this process that I never think about anymore and often have forgotten. And the, the process of talking about how these things happen and why and when and where and who has been an interesting exercise for me. And it continues to be. Um... And I hope, you know, I hope that some of these people that I've worked with over these years uh, see this stuff and uh, and realize how much I thought of them. I think a lot of them probably thought that I didn't think much of them, you know, and probably they had every right to think that. But the the fact of the matter is, is that never really got that angry with people that and stayed angry with them. I just don't have time for that. I've always kind of tried to look back at things and go, well, that's the way it was for them, and it was the way it was for me, and this blew up or that blew up or that caught fire or this guy, whatever. It should be under the bridge. Life's too short to hold a lifetime grudge against anybody. And... You know, people people don't change, I don't believe, but their environment changes. And uh, I haven't changed. I'm still a crotchety old asshole. But my environment has changed. And the people I'm around force me to mellow out and force me to all these things consider life differently, as does age. You know, and uh, yeah, so there you go. We're about to go into another chapter. <laughs> One of my favorite records I ever made, and I'll tell you what it's called next week. But well, I sure had a lot of fun with Andre Bourgeois, I'll tell you, and Russell Salter. Um, yeah, good times, good times. <laughs>
Oh boy.